Catherine Wright. There are two Catherines here, I guess. <laughs> oh, hi, the other Catherine. <laughs> we welcome Ranger Wright. Great, thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Catherine Wright, and I'm a park ranger for San Mateo County Parks. I lead the department's interpretive program and our efforts to provide environmental education, community outreach, and other opportunities in an equitable manner and to improve the understanding, enjoyment of and access to our county parks. So I'm really excited to speak with you today about one of our newest additions to our county park system, Tanitas Creek Beach, which you can see in the background behind me here. Um, so I'm gonna start out by doing a brief uh, background of the site and speak to some of the interesting geological, ecological and historical information that is relevant to this site. And it'll be somewhat of a sneak peek into some of the future programming opportunities that we'll have at the park. And then I'll go into some of the specifics about our planning process for this site as we prepare to open it up to the public. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to type those into the chat or um, at the end, I'll definitely have time for questions as well. So I'll get started. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen. And here is a little bit of an outline for today as I just spoke to. I want to orient you to where Tanis Creek Beach is located. Uh, it is um, along Highway 1 along the coast side um, right here. Uh, to orient you, Half Moon Bay is up here and south of Tanis, this is San Gregorio. State Beach and Highway 84. So it's right there at the southern part of our county. And inland from Tanitas Creek Beach, there is the Tanitas Creek Open Space Preserve. Um, and a little bit farther up in the watershed is the El Coro de Madera Creek Preserve. And those are both operated and managed by Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space Trust or Open Space. Uh, open Space. So. Next, I wanna talk about a bit about geology because um, I believe in one of the first uh, geology classes I took in college, the professor remarked that geology is quite literally the, the foundation for an ecosystem. Um, for example, the type of rock formation establishes the soil composition, which affects the species composition of plants and other creatures in that food web. And the underlying Geological forces also largely affect the topography of a given area, and we can see much of that present at Tanis Creek Beach. So about 25 million years ago, the subduction of the Pacific tectonic plate under the North American tectonic plate caused the formation of the San Andreas Fault, which we all probably know about. Um, and that runs up through California and in the Bay Area. We have many faults that branch off of the San Andreas Fault, including the San Gregorio Fault, which is pictured here. I apologize for this being a little blurry, uh, but this is the San Gregorio Fault running up along the coast side. And it um, empties out, or dumps out right south into the ocean, right south of Tunis Creek Beach, which is right here. And most of the movement from this fault and uh, the San Andreas Fault is lateral, meaning north and south, but the movement is also upward. And um, that has raised the picturesque bluffs that you see behind me that are in the photos here. Um, and much of the San Mateo County coastline, as well as the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, and so, more specifically, the bluffs at Tanitas are part of the Prisma Formation, which is uh, created or made of sandstone created by fine grains that accumulated layer upon layer um, about five million years ago in the shallow ocean waters offshore. And um, it's quite similar to what is happening offshore today. And at Tanitas, you can also find, oh, here's a, uh, close up look at what these bluffs look like um, from close. And they are very easily uh, erodible. So the, it's um, constantly changing. It's constantly, um, the coastline is constantly changing. And um, 
the Ethnias, you can find fossils of ancient clamshells, snails, and other marine organisms at the north and south ends of the beach in the, the bluffs and the reefs. And there's also some really cool formations called concretions, like you can see in this photo on the bottom left. And concretions are accumulations of sediment around a nucleus. So it could be a fossil or a shell or a pebble. And then that sand and other sediment is collected around that and compressed into a rock. Um, and so they're kind of these rocks that kind of stand out on the reefs or in the sandy sections of the beach um, that look kind of funny. And then they kind of create this like bubble shape. And then also, which interesting on top of it, you can see this type of weathering pattern. It's called tuffoni and it occurs in salt rich environments. And it's a type of physical and chemical weathering um, that makes these holy um, areas in these types of rocks. So it's a kind of interesting, different interesting uh, types of ge geology present here at these sites. So that's kind of a brief overview of the geology. And then next I'm gonna show some information about the different ecological systems at play. So the site overall is 58 acres and it includes these beautiful panoramic ocean views, nearly a mile of sandy beach. And the property itself supports a diversity of habitats, including of course the marine ecosystem offshore, um, the sandy beach and the dunes that are farther up closer to the bluffs. There's a coastal scrub in the bluff side here and uh, Monterey pine forests that are higher up on the bluffs and into the riparian section and this riparian creek corridor that comes out and sometimes of the year reaches all the way to the ocean. And then there's even intertidal habitats uh, in the rocky reefs off the beach at the north and south ends too. So lots of really cool different types of ecosystems present here. This picture on the top left is a picture um, just uh, right where this road comes down here, um, looking north of the bluffs, and then looking south on this one on the top right. And in the middle here is some of the uh, intertidal uh, di different organisms that you can find. So you have anemones and um, little snails and other creatures like that. And then this is also very crucial habitat, especially right here in this section for the snowy plover. The snowy plover pictured here is a federally, federally threatened uh, species of bird. They um, really heavily rely on the dune habitat for a nesting area, and uh, their populations have declined due to human disruption of those nesting habitats and loss of that habitat in general due to construction and other things. Uh, they're only about six inches long, and here is a picture of uh, an adult with two babies. Um, their breeding season is from March to September. So what we'll be doing with this site is uh, fencing off this area that's in red here to protect that habitat for this um, threatened species so that that species has a place to continue to thrive. Another really cool uh, portion of this property is the Tanitas Creek itself. It's a really important feature of the site. And the watershed for this creek extends very far inland and covers about 12 square miles. So here is a map on the upper right at this little section here is where the uh, confluence of the river is, dumps out into the ocean at different times of the year. And then the watershed itself reaches all the way up to skyline um, and comes down and it covers this area here as highlighted. Um, most of the uh, land cover is either scrub, grassland, or natural forest um, forest land. So it's pretty, pretty much um, preserved pretty well. Much of the watershed is privately owned, but there are sections like the El Coro de Madera uh, uh, Open Space Reserve and the Tanitas Creek Open Space Reserve that are managed by um, open space agencies. And this watershed is critical to support a number of different species, including the threatened steelhead trout, um, <clears throat> pictured here, and the dungeness crab. 
And over the year, there have been issues, over the years, there have been issues with crab poaching on Chinese Creek Beach, um, unfortunately. So that's something that we'll be having to consider as we move forward with managing this property. All right. So beyond uh, those, you know, unique species that I pointed out there, there's tons of other species that this site supports, um, including lots of rare, endangered, and unique species like um, all the ones featured here, and even this one, which is um, the Coastal Marsh Milk Fetch, a California Native Plants Society listed rare plant that is found on the beach property as well. And just to go back for a second, um, we, there's a really cool website that you can go to called inaturalist.org. And this website, uh, you can look up pretty much any place in the entire world that you're curious about, but let's say we're curious about Tanita's Creek Beach. So you can just go to the top here and search in the search bar Tanita's Creek Beach. And this is what will pop up. You'll have a list of all these different species that people have observed at this site over the years. And um, you can flip through the different species based off of different filters. You can filter out birds if you're only interested in birds. You can filter out um, plants if you're only interested in plants. It, it's really interesting. And you can also filter out specifically for a particular day too. So if you were only interested on August 18th, 2021 to see if anyone made any observations that day, you can do that as well. So it's a really interesting tool, a great tool for discovering lots of um, you know, species that are found in our parks and open spaces. And um, it's free to download the app on your phone, um, iNaturalist, you can find it in the app store and you can take observations as well. So if you're out in these parks and you take a picture and you're curious about what it is, uh, there is a, recognition software in, uh, incorporated into the app that will help you identify different species. It's not perfect, of course, um, but it can narrow it down for you. And then online, there's a whole um, host of uh, experts that are on there and they can also help narrow it down too. So um, iNaturalist is a great program in general. And if you go on there, you can see the over 158 species of uh, different creatures that people have found at Tinius Creek Beach already. All right, so that's just a brief, you know, overview of the different uh, ecosystems present on the site and the species that you can find there. Um, and now I'm going to just do a brief dive into the human history of the site, which is also very rich. Uh, so when it comes to human history, the first known residents are the Potogen tribe of the Ohlone peoples. There was a uh, village site called Taros, as seen on the map, um, with an estimated population of about 65 people. So right here, the Taros um, village site of the Potogen, um, and this is another village site of that same group of people. There were five uh, distinct cultural groups along the coast of San Mateo County. So we have the Kurosi um, here and here, the Ohan, Kodajin, the Shiguan up here, and the Aramai up in Pacifica. Um, and they had a deep connection to the land and a very long connection to the land as is evidenced by various archeological digs that have discovered items uh, such as this crescent shaped tool that you can see on the left here that dates back to at least 8,000 years. Um, and that was found at the archeological dig at Fitzgerald Marine Reserve, which is another one of our um, parks. And unfortunately in 1769, uh, Gaspar de Portola led an expedition up the coast of California in search for Monterey Bay. And they passed Monterey Bay um, and made the route that you can see here um, as highlighted in green. And uh, they stopped at various Ohlone villages as they made their way north until they became the first Europeans to see San Francisco Bay in, on November 4th, 1769. And then they continued down on the east side of the peninsula and then took the same route back south. 
Um, and this expedition would forever change the course of history for the Ohlone people and the development of what would become California. And at San Mateo County Parks, we have worked with a variety of agencies to create the Ohlone Portola Heritage Trail, which you can see the image in the bottom right corner here next to our uh, logo. And um, we are creating this heritage trail so that people can follow the route of this historic expedition and honor the history of the Ohlone people. And Tanitas Creek Beach is an important site along this future trail. As you can see right here, um, this is where they pass through. All right. So this really uh, led into the time of the Spanish and Mexican eras of California history. And the Spanish era, um, the, the Anza expedition that uh, succeeded the, um, <clears throat> the portal expedition uh, just six years later, uh, really established uh, people in this area, bringing um, more than 240 men, women, and children up uh, from New Spain into Alta California to, to uh, you know, settle the land. And um, in 1821, um, there was a shift in between the Spanish owning and offering the land using uh, missions and forts, as you can see imaged here. Um, and then in, after the Mexican-American War in 1821, um, Spain ceded Alta California to Mexico. And uh, the land was then divided up into Mexican land grants or ranchos. And you can see uh, a map on the right of the various ranchos of San Mateo County at that time between 1822 and 1846. And uh, for talking about Tanias Creek Beach, uh, right here where my cursor is, is where the mouth of Tanias Creek comes out. So that would establish uh, it be, being between uh, Rancho Cañada Verde, a Arroyo de la Parisima, and Rancho San Gregorio. So it's between those two different ranchos that were operated by two different uh, people. And then in 1846, um, there were early settlers, uh, colonizers to the land. Um, and one of the most famous of these is Alexander Gordon, who was a local builder and resident, and he moved to San Mateo County in 1863. Uh, he acquired a lot of land, which he farmed extensively and logged. And that was in the Tanitas Creek Valley as well as the San Gregorio Creek Valley. Um, he had a, um, an idea for a way to get lumber down, uh, lumber and goods down to ships. And this is the famous Gordon Chute illustrated on this slide here. It was constructed off of the edge of the bluffs at Tanitas Creek Beach here. Um, and it was a 45 degree angle um, built into the cliffs, but although it wasn't very practical uh, because the conditions had to be almost perfect for ships to be loaded, um, they needed to have high tides and calm seas. Otherwise it would have just been too rocky and, and um, move, like the movement too much to get the ship, uh, things loaded onto the ship. And it was also reports that there were, you know, burlap sacks of grain and potatoes that sped down the chute so fast um, that they actually caught fire before they hit the ship and potentially endangered the ship below. Um, this was an operation for about 13 years before it was eventually swept away by a storm in 1885. And on the site today, you can still see the bolts in the rock walls at Tanitas Creek Beach and in the cement foundations off of the reef at low tide. On the upper right photo, um, this is an image of people uh, being driven by a horse-drawn carriage. And um, just a little bit of background here, just related to Tanitas Creek Beach area. Um, in, uh, in present day, we have Kings Mountain Road um, that goes from Woodside area up to the eastern side of Skyline, Highway 35. And then on the 
other side, it meets Tunigas Creek Road that goes from Skyline all the way out to Tunigas Creek Beach. And so the first section of that that was created was built in 1868. Um, and it was called the Redwood City and San Gregorio Turnpike. And it was uh, built from the eastern side from Redwood City up to the top of Skyline. Um, and then, uh, then that turnpike was extended um, in 1875. And that portion was called the Tunigas Creek Turnpike. And that brought people all the way down to the coast from the ridge. Um, and eventually that was acquired as a county road by San Mateo County in 1884. Um, but in the intermittent time, those nine years, uh, Gordon and his partner, Fromont, uh, charged travelers to cross over that ridge uh, by vehicles such as this in this photo. And then in the bottom right photo, this is an image of the Saunders Mill in Tanitas Canyon um, up in the watershed of Tanitas Creek. And uh, you can see in the back of the photo, an oxen uh, group of oxen that was driving the lumber and they would have been driving it down Tanitas Creek Road to potentially to uh, the Gordon's Chute to be loaded onto ships. So a little bit of history there about the use of the site. Next, uh, the Ocean Shore Railroad. So um, the Ocean Shore Railroad was thought of as a connector uh, from San Francisco to Santa Cruz and uh, along the coast side. And so in this map on the right, you can see uh, starting in San Francisco and all the stops that it made along the coast side as it went south and Santa, all the way to Santa Cruz. Unfortunately, this vision didn't come fully to fruition. And this occurred in the early 1900s. Um, the idea started in 1905 timeframe. And um, they started sections from north from Santa Cruz and made it all the way to Swanton area and south from San Francisco, making it all the way to Tunitas, but not making it past Tunitas. Um, so here's an image of what the Ocean Shore Railroad looked like. And this is um, as it's passing Devil Slide, which was one of the most treacherous portions of the railway. And here is an example of a little brochure advertising this. Unfortunately, um, there were a lot of rocks slide at, at Devil Slide that were a constant headache and they had to constantly keep getting the rocks off of the um, train tracks as well as repairing the train tracks that were damaged. And, and then unfortunately, eventually the railroad went bankrupt in the early 1920s. Um, and you can actually see, if you look closely in that, and in this image um, at Tunitas, this is the, these are the cliffs here at Tunitas Creek Beach. Um, and there you can still somewhat see where the tracks um, were, the rail grade, uh, if you will, of the railway, if you follow my cursor uh, south. And it's right in this indentation here. And it ended right here where those buildings were here at Gordon Chute. Um, right here is Highway 1 in comparison next to it. So this is where the track would have been or had been for the uh, Ocean Shore Railroad and where it ended. And um, from Tunitas South, people could make that journey if they wanted to. They just had to ride in a vehicle such as this from Tunitas all the way to Swanton to catch the next section of the railway. Um, and that was about 26 miles to go between those two areas. And eventually the, um, you know, the, the section never made it past Tunitas Creek South, unfortunately. All right, so I have a couple more um, interesting notable figures uh, that have history involving Tunitas Creek Beach. And then I'll jump into our project of what we're working on to develop it for the public. So the first figure is Grafton Tyler Brown. He was an African-American painter, lithographer, and cartographer born in Pennsylvania. And he moved out to the West Coast and lived in San Francisco. And he was one of the first African-American painters to make um, the West his uh, work subject. Um, so here is an example of some of his work that you may be familiar with. Um, this is a lithographic print of Gordon Shute as well, and um, some other 
uh, paint or paintings that he did of uh, Gordon's properties in San Gregorio here on the right and of Gordon's uh, residence in Redwood City here at the top. Next, we have Sybil Easterly, who was an artist pictured here on the right. Uh, who actually lived at the mouth of Tanitas Creek at a home there. She graduated from San Francisco Mark Hopkins School of Art and was uh, gained notoriety, notoriety across the country for her artwork and was also known for uh, extravagant dinner parties. Um, here's some examples of her artwork. Um, here's, and both of these paintings can be found at the San Mateo County Historical Museum. Um, and uh, she was married to uh, Lewis Paulson um, in 1915, and they opened a saloon along the Ocean Shore Railroad tracks at the, the end of the line, I guess you will, um, at Smeetis Creek Beach. And none of those buildings, as far as I'm aware, are still um, present on the site. All right, so um, now I'm gonna kind of go into what this property has been used as in the most recent years. Um, and what we're doing to get it ready for the public now that it is uh, San Mateo County Park. So in the most recent years, um, unfortunately, this site has gone um, into disuse and uh, has been the site of a lot of raves and large parties and hasn't had any management agency to uh, make sure that the property is well maintained. So that has led to a lot of trash buildup um, and we have done several beach cleanups along with other partners um, to make sure that the site is pristine. Um, here's some more images of beach cleanups. Um, there have been illegal camping on the site as well as um, just large amount of cars from overnight raves and parties, as I've mentioned. Um, and unfortunately, these large scale parties and raves um, are also dangerous because there is limited cell reception in case of any sort of emergency. There wasn't really any um, public access point to this site for a long time. Um, and the only ways down were through a really tight trail through um, the creek or down the very steep cliff face uh, of the property. So um, yeah, very hard. It would be hard to access for emergency personnel if need be. Um, in 2017, uh, Peninsula Open Space Trust, Post, purchased the property from the former owner. And um, at San Mateo County Parks, we started doing daily patrols of the beach to make sure that, you know, there's litter pickup and that uh, illegal activities weren't uh, occurring. So it's been in the works for a little time now. And throughout this um, planning process for the site, these have been the core values that the planning team created, environmental protection, equity and inclusion, education and awareness, and outdoor experiences. Um, and they wanted to establish this new park from scratch, but with some history of the prior responsible use. And they met a number of times to draft up these core values to guide this development of the park. All right, so this is an aerial view of the property looking south. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's 50 acres total. Uh, and the property that the county parks manages is um, bounded by Tanitas Creek here at the north end and by the south here at this uh, knoll that you can see. Um, and Tanitas Creek runs um, east to west and across the the street is the open space um, preserve managed by Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and then I wanted to highlight these um, features and these boxes that are uh, import important to the property and, and the design that we are working on. So here's Highway 1 uh, here. Uh, this is the north and headed south. Um, this is the existing residence that we have right here that we will be talking about a little bit later in the presentation. Um, Neas Creek right here, which is our northern boundary of the site. We have the top bluff, the mid bluff, and the, the beach. So those are gonna be all important features as I move forward. All right, 
I will talk about some um, accessibility in the coming slides, so stay tuned. All right, so uh, given those constraints, um, the, the team um, had divided up the property into different levels of development from high development and up with the parking and overlook area up here to low to moderate development, um, including accessibility um, structures, amenities, and native plant restoration areas um, to the rest of the site being minimally developed with basically only, um, you know, you're at your normal, like your single track trail and um, restoration efforts to restore some of the sites that have been damaged over the years. And then on the beach itself, no development except for in this area right here, installing a fence around the snowy plover nesting site. So here is a view up from um, up above, looking down uh, on the beach to from the south to the north. Um, and this is an existing pullout that is on the site where people can park. And traffic studies uh, have indicated that the peak usage of this um, pullout is about 60 cars. So the parking area that will be constructed will have 60 cars with uh, extra areas for overflow and or bus parking. Um, and there is has been an issue on this section of Highway 1 uh, about motor speed and the number of accidents. So we are making sure to take those into consideration when developing this parking area to minimize any um, potential hazards there. Um, this is a picture of the existing driveway that led down to that um, house that I kind of pointed out on the bluff and I'll um, talk a little bit more about later. Um, and this is going to be used for maintenance vehicles and park staff to go down and patrol uh, sections of the property, but there will be a different uh, way for the you know uh, visitors to the site to access the different areas of the property. This is a picture of the existing residence that's uh, that is damaged and abandoned and will be demolished. And this site will be used for a gathering area, maybe an amphitheater or like a picnic area um, in this section for visitors to use. And this is in the mid bluff section. And here's a view uh, from the top of the access path to the beach. And this section to the bottom left is the area that will be fenced off for the snowy plover protection zone. And to me, this creek right here in the middle um, is a creek that seasonally runs to the ocean. Um, and there is a trail you can see on the north side of the creek that is an alternate access point to the creek and the, the beach and it comes from Tanita's Creek Road. Um, and we're trying to develop a safer route to get to the beach and that's more environmentally friendly as well. All right, so as part of this process, we did do a number of community engagement events um, over the past year and a half. And um, so we had several webinars that we hosted, gathering feedback, and we had um, a couple of phases of surveying along the coast side to, um, and, and the rest of the county uh, to get responses about what were the you know, things that people wanted to see in regards to the site and the development of it. And so um, we had nearly 900 responses, and here's some of the breakdown of uh, where people responded from and, and their age groups. Um, we, most people said that they would want to come to Tanita's Creek Beach to walk, relax, picnic, and enjoy views. And the main priorities for improving the site centered on uh, land and wildlife preservation and restoration, having public restrooms, accessibility, and overnight security. Um, and respondents wanted to mostly keep the site as natural as possible, but wanted to see uh, improved accessibility and more information about the site overall. And so many respondents were also excited to see opportunities for community stewardship programs, wildlife viewing programs, and uh, cultural programs about the indigenous peoples. 
Um, here or so, we have some considerations that we had to take into place when, when we were going into creating our preferred conceptual design for how to develop the site. Um, and one of the main features is the geologic instability of the property. It is very active. Um, and we also wanted to consider sea level rise. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, these bluffs are part of the Prisma formation made of sandstone and they erode very e uh, easily. And they also have the uh, capability uh, to have active landslides. So these different areas that these arrows that point um, down the, the cliffs, uh, these are the, probably the most active landslides on the property. And there's also ones shown here that are more uh, dormant landslides. Also on this slide, you can see the mean high water mark in this lighter blue color, and then plus sea level rise potential um, uh, projections in this darker blue, and the same with this lighter purple and darker purple for the potential flood elevation um, marks. So these are something, some elements that we wanted to take into consideration while developing our potential or preferred conceptual design for the site. All right, so this is the preferred conceptual design that um, has been proposed and that the public has had a chance to weigh in on. Um, I'm gonna go through the different features here uh, in a cl much closer in for each section, but I just wanted to kind of give this overview. Um, <clears throat> So there's these three different zones, the top bluff, the mid bluff, and uh, the beach. And um, there's gonna be a loop trail that you can see right here, starting from the parking lot and extending out along this southern portion of the property and, and entering here. So you could, in theory, potentially take this loop trail and loop around and then walk back up uh, to the mid bluff and all the way through there. Um, they're estimating that it would be about a eight to 10 minute walk down from the top bluff to from the mid bluff um, to the beach. And um, we are proposing improvements that will increase accessibility and have been in discussions about uh, programmatic access, um, including potentially you know, rides down to the beach in a Kubota, um, which is a type of ATV, um, all-terrain vehicle, or maybe even a beach wheelchair access at some point in the future. So uh, next, uh, this is just kind of a closer up look at uh, the top bluff portion of this property. Um, there's going to be, this is the parking area, and there's gonna be an overlook spot right here There'll be 60 regular stalls, five ADA stalls, and uh, drop-off spots, and, and overflow parking areas, and potentially even more overflow parking. Um, there's going to be an entrance and an exit to try to limit the potentials for vehicle collisions. Um, and then there's these existing trails that I had mentioned a little bit earlier that were basically like sailing the cliff to get down. Um, and we're gonna be closing these trails and uh, doing plant restoration in these areas to improve the sites. This was also gonna be a future connection for the California Coastal Trail, although there are no um, connections north and south of this at this point. And this would be a potential, uh, like a schematic or view of what this uh, site would look like once these, um, uh, if this, uh, features are completed. And this is a shot of the existing site conditions. All right, so this is the um, mid bluff section. Uh, this is our parking lot area. And then this is our trail bound to the mid bluff. This trail here um, that winds around would be um, an ADA accessible pedestrian path to the mid bluff area and this mid bluff area would have an amphitheater and potentially some picnic sites and some interpretive panels. On the other side, we would have a nature walk area um, with more information about the different um, species that you can find in this uh, site. And up here, you'd have the drop off area for the vehicles. 
Um, along this ADA path, we'd also have uh, different benches or seating options to rest and have views of the bluffs. And this is kind of a, a look of what it could look like um, moving forward. And this is uh, just for reference, this is where that residence is currently that would be torn down and replaced with this. Um, and here's another view of what that could look like. And this is the existing view on the bottom right. Okay, and so then this is the that loop trail that would loop around the southern part of the property and have some different overlook points and um, access the beach at the southern end. And uh, this is a overall overview of what the full loop would look like. It's about a little less than two miles for that full loop trail. And these are the next steps for this project. Um, in February of 2021, this year, we presented this uh, preferred conceptual design to the Board of Supervisors and it was approved. And right now we are going through uh, environmental documentation uh, for the California Environmental Quality Act, the CEQA. And um, this fall we'll be completing the final design and permitting um, and doing additional outreach to different community organizations. Um, and then in the next uh, spring, we hope to, uh, you know, get the contract together with the company that will be working on the project and commence construction and open it in the following spring in 2023. Um, so that's kind of an overview of this brand new park that we have that we're so excited to uh, feature for, um, you know, our 24 parks in San Mateo County. It's an amazing site, as you can see, with uh, great history, um, geology, and um, lots of beautiful, you know, sites to see, and um, we're really excited about it. So uh, if you have any questions about this site, I'd be happy to answer them now. I'm going to stop sharing, um, and yeah, go ahead and, and ask away. I have a question, um, Catherine. Um, yeah. For the beach. So right now we can't get there. It's not going to be done till next year, or can we? Yeah. So currently the site isn't open um, to the general public, um, and unfortunately we won't be able to open it until all these uh, construction uh, is completed. Um, huh. And yeah, so this is the the timeline that we're working with at this point, uh, opening it up in spring of 2023. Thank you. Um, so the, the beach uh, north of this future park is, I believe, technically managed by private property owners that uh, have houses just above the beach in that section. And um, the creek itself, to answer the first question, the creek itself, I don't believe, will have um, access uh, via wheelchair, although we may be able to work in, like I had mentioned, ATV rides or um, a beach wheelchair type situation uh, to that section of the property. Um, most of the wheelchair access will take you down to the, the mid bluff, um, but because the section from mid bluff down to the beach is too steep um, to provide uh, ADA compliant um, access, unfortunately. And it's a county park, so well, and it's a beach, so no dogs will be allowed anywhere. We're um, still considering different uses at this point, so there hasn't been any definitive answer in that regard. Um, we're still getting, you know, feedback from uh, the community and our engagement process about that um, at a number of different sites in the county. So um, there hasn't been any official decision on. Um, whether there would be dog access or, you know, equestrian access or uh, biking access or any of that type of um, 
you know, final decisions yet. Yeah. Cause that loop trail, it's like, it would be great walk with a dog, but I get dogs in the snowy plovers, not a good combo. <laughs> yeah. That, that is something to consider for the site because the, the trail does go pretty close to the snowy plover habitat on the north end of the property. Yeah. And, well, um, to you, it's, it's not ruled out completely yet. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. Um, we have a, uh, the interpretive program, which is the program that I lead for the department, um, is in charge of programs um, as far as, you know, doing programs like this or uh, classroom, you know, trips for schools or field trips or um, nature hikes or history talks or any of those kinds of different programs. So our interpretive program is actually leading um, a strategic plan at this point with a lot of community engagement opportunities. And we'll be putting out a survey in the next couple of weeks. And we wanna hear back from people about different types of uses and types of programs and events that they would like to see featured in our county parks um, as part of our strategic plan for the next five to 10 years and how we you know, um, structure our programs moving forward. So um, I will definitely get the information out to Trevon um, to pass out to anyone who's interested um, and possibly be our topic for next month. I don't know <laughs> if I'm joining next month. So um, stay tuned for that. And I would definitely appreciate any feedback on that from you all. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thanks. Any other questions? Well, I think you. there's one in the chat. Um, I see the two that I answered. Um, and I, and I agree, Bruce, I think that this is uh, going to be a really great site and I'm excited for everyone to get a chance to see it. Um, it's, it's a gorgeous location. Yep, I don't think there's any other questions. <clears throat> well, thank you so much, Catherine. We'll see you next time. Yeah, thank you. And uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye, Take care. Bye-bye.